And as most of you probably already know, she is the research director of the Neurosciences Program at Sunnybrook Hospital. She holds the Braille Chair in Neurology, and she is a professor in the Faculty of Medicine in Neurology at U of T. And you do one other thing with the network. Uh, well, there's a stroke network. There's oh, there's a, a whole bunch. Research <laughs> Alliance. Yeah. The woman is amazing. Uh, she is a wonderful colleague, I can tell you personally, and she is a fantastic mentor of students. So we are very fortunate to have her with us today. So you're on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm uh, always happy to talk about uh, this topic, and um, I see I'm going to be preaching to the converted to some extent with the other uh, major neurological figure in the room, so hi, Peter. <laughs> um, and I think most everyone else here is probably not an MD, is that right? Is there any other MDs in the... No? No? So there's just two of us. But there, I, there are people I, online. I think you've got radical thinkers here. Um, <laughs> Peter is maybe on the left of me, but... Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I think there actually are diseases. You think there's... You think it's mostly aging? <laughs> and I think you've already heard from him in this okay. series. Yeah. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is... Um, something I actually have already heard from Peter and many other people probably, and that is that um, in terms of vascular health care initiatives, which there's starting to be a lot of interest in, in, in sort of a prevention mentality that's um, emerging as essential in our health care system if we're going to be able to afford um, the uh, aging boom, um, preventing cognitive decline has got to be on the agenda. I mean, most of the prevention and other trials that have happened in the last 25 years in the field of cardiology, hypertension, etc., even diabetes, um, cognition has been an afterthought. Occasionally it's put in there, it's been, it's been assessed in a very superficial manner, um, and I think it's uh, unfortunate that 25 or 30 years of hypertension trials have not actually given as much information as they could have had there been a little more attention to something <coughs> called cognition. Is cognition important? Um, I think so. I mean, not having a heart attack is important, not having a stroke is important, but if you are um, surviving uh, because you um, now have congestive heart failure with, with advances in managing heart uh, problems, or you know, you're surviving a stroke, but you're cognitively impaired, that's a huge impact on the quality of your life. Um, so, I don't think I have to make too many more uh, comments about that, except that it really is important it's been under-investigated. The other point about this is maybe the same, same thing put a different way, but it is that the brain has therefore got to be a key target organ for emergency interventions. And not just because it's the organ of cognition and behavior and mood and, and everything that makes us sort of human, um, but because again, it's not been um, so adequately tested, although I have to say that it's only in the last maybe 10 years with emerging technologies, on invasive technologies, that we really can look at the brain in a whole new way as, a, as actually a target of both systematic, systemic, I should say, um, vascular risk factors, as well as, risk, uh, as well as diseases within the brain vessels. And I think this takes advantage of modern neuroimaging imaging in a way that's high tech, um, but nevertheless uh, revealing and important because we can get objective understanding often while people are still alive about what is going on in the brain. And then finally what I want to really emphasize is that there's a very important kind of dual um, pathology going on in the brain, a sort of a, a dual to death, uh, at least uh, to disability and death, of vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease in the human brain. It may be, an, an, at the very minimum, uh, an additive factor to, the Alzheimer's, to Alzheimer's disease in the sense of ex expression, but I'm actually a believer that uh, vascular disease is etiologically relevant to how Alzheimer's disease uh, develops, at least in, in, in the elderly population or in the sort of sporadic form of the disease. So in a sense, that's my conflict of interest. I, I consult for various companies in a minor and shrinking way because there have been fewer and fewer trials that have shown success um, in these conditions, and 
all the previous um, funders are, the, the drugs are going generic, so there isn't much opportunity to do this anymore, but this is the last sort of five years. However, I don't have any stock equity that's in interests and <laughs> conflicts that are relevant to this presentation. Um, so I, I used the European data because I just thought it was so striking. It came out, um, I guess, uh, two years ago now. Um, but I thought I'd put it together in a, in a way that's so flippy. And they were talking about the size and burden of mental health and other brain disorders just in Europe. So um, every year, 38% of the population suffers from a mental illness or neurodegenerative disease. Um, these are the largest contributor <coughs> to the total morbidity burden as measured by adults, it's over 25%. The most disabling conditions are depression, dementia, alcohol use, and stroke. And the total uh, cost of these disorders was around 800 billion in 2010. And the way that broke down, I thought was interesting. So mood disorders about 100 billion, dementia 100 billion, psychotic disorders 93 billion, anxiety, addiction, stroke each were about 60 billion. These are very expensive diseases, and I just don't know why they're so under the radar. I mean, and we've got a World Health Organization and uh, other organizations that are, you know, probably concerned about um, cerebrovascular, uh, sorry, cardiovascular diseases, not so much cerebrovascular, cardiovascular diseases. And we have infectious diseases. We have lots of um, public health uh, issues. We have, you know, gun control issues, which is a public health issue in some countries. Uh, we have pollution, which is a, a problem in Know, the second greatest economy is the capital right now, so the people can even order their houses, uh, or I should say apartments, because they're mostly apartments. Um, so we've got lots of issues, but you know, brain and brain disorders have not been on the agenda to the extent that my colleague uh, Vladimir Kshinsky and, and uh, in the World Neurology Organization and the World Stroke Organization, I think they're moving toward a, a, a meeting in London in 2015, which is really meant to say, hey, world, you got a problem. There's something called the brain, and it's 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 hurting. It's having all kinds of problems in kids, in midlife, and certainly in late life. And as um, you know, developing countries start to grow older people, it's going to be huge, and it's going to be ugly if we don't do something about it. Because even in our society, it's pretty ugly. The services <coughs> are available for people and for families that are suffering from these conditions are are not something that we should be proud of. I think there's so much room for improvement. Um, that it's kind of embarrassing. Mm -hmm. The costs are higher in brain disorders than men because the nice thing about cardiovascular disease is it often kills you. And that's cheap from a societal point of view, right? Except now that's not so much the case. So people are surviving with congestive heart failure, for example. And people with congestive heart failure, not only do they have trouble moving around, but they also have cognitive problems. It's just under the radar. People with diabetes, people with cardiovascular disease, people with all kinds of like, cancer disease, um, you know, you get radiation and chemotherapy and other kinds of effects. It's all hurt the brain. So we have really got to start uh, putting this on the agenda a bit more, I think, in terms of healthcare consequences. So final point, a third of all health-related expenses are caused by brain disorders. And it's not really on the radar. In fact, even infectious diseases um, often cause Brain so we got the aging trends. So 1900 life expectancy was 47 years old, uh, 47 years. There are about 3 million people in the U.S., about 4% of the population, um, who were older than, 60, than 65, and they were all not very well. Um, they, were, they were kind of super ageers, they were over 65, but they still weren't feeling so great. By 1990, life expectancy was over 75. 30 million people were older than 65. That's about 12% of the population. And we were starting to have people who were kind of healthy. I mean, reasonable, uh, reasonably independent and reasonable quality of life. As of 2000, I thought this was a really interesting article in Lancet 2011. They were speculating that 50% of children born in the year 2000 be expected to live to 100 years. Half that population. Now that's kind of assuming that uh, global warming doesn't wipe us out, and that <laughs> pandemics uh, don't wipe us out. But sort of assuming that there's still 
and we only have a couple of generations before the global warming thing is going to be huge, and we've seen some of that now. Um, so it takes you know certain assumptions, but nevertheless, very striking to think about that because aging rivals all of these factors for the common forms of Alzheimer's disease and stroke. So there is trouble brewing. Um, and that's because, you know, we're starting to see um, you know, this conversion of this, this previous uh, pattern from just like 10 years ago to estimates in 2050, they're going to have this overburdened younger generation trying to sort out how they're going to take care of all these older people. By the way, in that Lancet article, um, they were speculating that, or they were saying, you know, the 20th century um, was about redistribution of income. The 21st century is going, about, is going to be about the redistribution of work. So that people will not be retiring in the same like, age or stage that they used to. Um, there will have to be uh, understandings. I mean, people will work fewer work hours per week, distributed over many more years. And if they live reasonable lifestyles, they might even be able to enjoy the extra hours that they um, have throughout their lifespan. Um, but uh, it, it is going to be uh, you know, a major challenge. I think we're starting to see now some of the economic aftermaths of job opportunities not available for younger people because people are retiring and um, what, how do we support um, some of these pension plans, etc. Uh, so um, starting a couple years ago, I think when the boomer population first round reached the age of 65, in the U.S., 10,000 baby boomers are reaching 65 every day in the U.S. Um, for the first time in history, I think this is a very striking comment. In developed in some developing countries, adults have more parents than children. So uh, in Canada, to get more specific, the prevalence of dementia is about uh, 500,000. This is updated uh, now. It's a little over 500,000. Expected to be over a million um, in a generation. The total economic burden now is 15 billion. Uh, that was actually a couple of years ago, uh, and expected to be uh, 10 times that in a, in a generation 2038. With a cumulative total economic burden of about 872 billion over the next 30 years. Now remember, we're the size of California. Okay, so. Then Europe outdoes us, US outdoes us, China is off the map in terms of the billions of dollars of cost eventually, potentially, if you're actually trying to take care of people. So we're, you know, we're small potatoes, but in our own society, we're very geographically dispersed. We've got uh, provincial organizations in charge of health and uh, social uh, welfare, et cetera. And so um, you know, we really, uh, we've got a lot to uh, get right in the next little while for those of us who are imminently um, entering this, uh, this age of danger. So that's sort of the big background. And what I want to do now is dig a little bit into some uh, you know, medical information. Um, I know many of you are not uh, pathologists or neurologists or cardiologists or whatever. But I think it's important for you to know what kind of data we're working with and sort of um, try to understand uh, uh, some of uh, what's out there in terms of the evidence. Um, when I do talks to just kind of the general public, I usually don't um, suppress all of the, you know, biological delivery information. I think it's important for people to be educated and learn about um, the, the biology as well as the psychology of, of, of the brain. I understand uh, cognitive and brain aging in the same way as they understand body aging. And I think we've also done a pretty bad job of that. So, um, the first... Uh, important point is that comorbid Alzheimer's disease and cerebrovascular disease is increasingly the reality of the cause of dementia in our aging population. So a whole bunch of things follow from that. One is that the silos of how we organize you know, agencies for care and education and um, funding, etc., don't exactly work. So you've got you know your Stroke Foundation and your Parkinson Foundation and your Alzheimer's Foundation, <coughs> etc., and everybody's competing for dollars, and you know it gets kind of complicated. Um, the truth 
truth is, life is messy, patients are messy, they don't read the textbooks, they don't know exactly what you're supposed to do if you have Alzheimer's disease, they just, you know, have it. And if they're older, they usually have other things. And uh, this is, has been hinted at by, I think, discoveries of the last 20 years where it's become clear that vascular risk factors are risk factors for cognitive impairment in general, but you know, Alzheimer's disease, as well as for stroke and you know, vascular causes of uh, dementia, let's say. I've listed some, this is not complete. Um, I've highlighted the, you know, the few I'm going to emphasize today. Age, um, hypertension, and uh, physical inactivity, I mean, I'm talking a little bit about physical activity, as well as other risk factors. I mean, genetic risk factors you can't do much about. Um, cholesterol, you, you can do a lot about with health, uh, with medications and diet. Diabetes can be managed. Um, atrial fibrillation, again, is often the link to coronary artery disease, but um, that can cause silent and overt strokes. <coughs> Preventing stroke also helps. Poor dietary habits, the fault, you know, the trilogy of what we all find comfort in, which is fat, sugar, and salt, um, is also something that uh, really, uh, really matters. In fact, I just had a conversation with a colleague the other day who was saying they were trying to uh, create a, um, a kind of a typical uh, North American diet, you know, full of fat, sugar, and salt in um, some rodent bottles. And the problem, because they wanted to um, eventually see how they, you know, what would happen to their blood vessels and their brain, etc. And they can't get them to live long enough to develop the diseases that they were trying to study. <laughs> so they've got to come back in some way or they just die. <laughs> so I think uh, human beings are very adaptable, including to, you know, periods of famine and also too much food, but um, neither is so good for you. Actually, famine is probably better for you. Um, so in the community autopsy series, series where this is, this is done not through a, a clinic, a memory clinic, but where people are donating their brains uh, based on a population sample. Um, this is where, these are again just a few examples um, showing that Alzheimer's disease by itself, and that's, that's not looking at all the pathology that's there, but it's sort of little, little strokes and things. 24 to, 24 to 36. Alzheimer's plus cerebrovascular lesions, close to 50%, and vascular dementia, anywhere from 3 to 13%, depending on the population uh, study. So, for example, this population was um, uh, nuns, and I'm going to talk about, maybe I'll have to talk about them or not. These, these were women who were in uh, some convents, and they agreed to you know, be studied after the age of 75. They were all highly educated. They had uh, all been in the convents in their 20s. Um, they followed, uh, they thought the right thoughts, they did the right things, they were active, um, and uh, many of them lived into their 90s and hundreds. And uh, they were the ones who sort of showed that um, you could have Alzheimer's disease by pathology, the criteria, and not be demented. In fact, in the first series, you know, 50, only 57% of those with card carrying Alzheimer's pathology were actually demented. So somehow they were resisting it. But if they had little strokes, 93% of them were along with the Alzheimer's pathology. So it looked like there was something going on there between stroke disease or vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease, one of the things. In a British population study uh, through family doctors, where the median age was about 85, they found that 78% of the patients had Alzheimer's disease and 78% had cerebrovascular disease, with what's called small vessel disease being the most common type of small uh, cerebrovascular disease. I'm going to talk a lot more about that, about 70%. So that data has been around for, you know, um, 15 years. And yet it's still percolating through the system. There's still, you know, there are huge studies um, being uh, run on sort of brain imaging, for example, Alzheimer's disease or imaging initiative, where you're not supposed to be in it if you've got any vascular disease. And, you know, my, my own experience in the work I've been doing for many years is if you're lucky, you'll find 20% of Alzheimer's patients who have no visible vascular lesions. So they're kind of focusing on 20% of a much bigger sample, um, trying to figure out you know, how you're going to do studies. Well, I mean, you can do studies, 
on the 20%, but then you've got the real world to actually give these drugs to, for example. So it, it's kind of a bit, uh, you know, it's kind of, it, it's a cleaner experiment as, as uh, clinical researchers, but it, the generalization is going to be a problem, potentially. Um, this is a study that was done in Chicago, again, a community-based study, which just brings this home. So if you're not demented, when you die in this study, and these are community-dwelling individuals who kindly were studied and uh, gave their you know, readings to science, um, you had a good chance uh, when you died. Uh, I think, again, they were in their uh, late 70s or 80s. Um, you had a good chance of not actually having any pathology, which is kind of nice to know what happens. Um, a lot of people had Alzheimer's disease, even though they were demented. Um, some <coughs> had strokes, infarction, that is. Smaller number had Parkinson's and Lee body disease. And there were even some people who had mixed combinations, right? Because it's just these things are happening in parallel. Um, some are interactive, some are probably just in parallel. All the neurodegenerative diseases might be interactive. I mean, we don't, you know, that's just studies of dogmas. If you were demented, very few had no pathology. Um, a substantial number of had Alzheimer's disease. A smaller number had infarctions. Parkinson's are the same because it's more often just combined. And most people had combinations of these diseases. So again, it's just there are several studies that keep into this point. And yet we keep pretending that there are all these pure diseases. Including that, you know, vascular dementia uh, caused just by infarction is not so common. Um, and partly I think it's because of successive treatment hypertension, etc. It was much more common 30 years ago. So these diseases and the way things are um, evolving are changing because of some efficacy we have in the management of some of these factors. <clears throat> now, the other thing that I always startles people, and, and I kind of make this uh, point, because how many of you would risk, uh, how many of you would risk as a risk factor for stroke, Alzheimer's disease? But it is, for all kinds of reasons, I'll show you. Not just because of hemorrhage, it's, it's a common cause of hemorrhage in the brain. So this rogue protein called amyloid beta 4042 is toxic. <coughs> Toxic substance. Some people think it's toxic to do a job. It may be to actually um, kill parasites and bacteria in the brain. This is what I'm sort of thought that radical thought has come out recently, saying um, you know everything's got a use in the brain and amyloid precursor protein from which the amyloid beta is derived by a certain cleavage. It's a transmembrane protein on cells. It's probably involved in brain repair. And it involves cholesterol, and that's where ApoE4 and all these things start to matter. And so, um, when it gets cleaved in a certain way into these 40, 42 fragments, polypeptide fragments, these tend to, in a combined form, actually be um, injurious to cells and also to deposit eventually, polymerize and deposit. But maybe they were there in the first place to be injurious to parasites and maybe allow you to survive. Maybe that's why ApoE4, which is kind of bad for you, um, you know, maybe that's, that's why it survived in a gene pool <coughs> of humans. Um, but from the point of view of too much of this, it's, it's bad for everything. It's not just bad for neurons, it's bad for vascular cells, vascular epithelial cells, it's bad for smooth muscle cells in the arterial walls. It's bad for the supporting cells, what we call the oligodendroglia cells, and the astrocytic cells, it's just bad um, if you have too much of it, or in the oligomeric form. And so what happens is, one form of it, the, the 40 fragment, tends to be deposited along the uh, walls of uh, arteries, possibly also veins, but they don't have muscles in the, in the walls, whereas the arteries have muscular walls, and it actually damages the wall, eventually they can actually cause occlusion of the artery, arterial, or rupture of the arterial. Also, the beta can obliterate capillaries, which are you know, the little channels that go between arterioles and venules. And there's even some data that suggests that um, the muscle cells in people with Alzheimer's disease are abnormal. They don't react properly to lack of oxygen. You're supposed to expand and open up the artery and let more blood through if you're hypoxic. And in Alzheimer's patients, it looks like they contract, so there's something abnormal going on. So there's a lot of ischemic stuff 
that may be happening in Alzheimer's disease. Some people even think there may be antibodies to vessels that are causing damage to vessels as something important happening at least some types of Alzheimer's disease. So what happens when you burst a vessel because of the smooth wall being um, destroyed by amyloid, you get something like this shown here in this person's brain. And uh, this is a CT scan, so front of the brain, back of the brain. Uh, everyone must know these black things. Those are the ventricles where spinal fluid is produced, so it's kind of normal to have that. This was a high-function corporate lawyer um, who uh, one day seemed to be a bit confused in his uh, workplace, and he, he was kind of bumping into things on the right, and he was not speaking properly. So it's not that he was drunk uh, or something, but uh, finally the work uh, mate said, you better go to the hospital. <coughs> and they took him to the hospital. Uh, usually when somebody's confused, the first thing they do is a scan. And this, on this scan, the left side of the brain is on the right side of the picture because they're looking from, at the person from feet up. And can, everybody can see this big blob. You don't have to be a radiologist to see this big blob. Okay? This big blob is a clot of blood. And this man um, had this large hemorrhage, but it sort of was a leaky, slow clot. It was like a sudden burst that would get with hypertension. It was uh, that, you know, some of these weakened vessels that allowed blood to get out and then it kept growing. So he was actually aphasic. He had a problem speaking, he had a problem reading, he had a problem you know, making his hands do what he wanted to do, something called apraxia. He had a visual field defect, but he could walk and he could sort of talk, and so it wasn't obvious until the scan was done what was going on. Now, it changed his life, right? He could never go back to work, although he went back eventually to living with some uh, assistance. He was quite wealthy. Um, a, a couple weeks later, we did an MRI scan, and I think, again, you don't have to be a radiologist to, to appreciate that this, this is the MRI scan of this area where he had the stroke. You can see blackness here, and you can see another uh, you know, you can see little black dots and little black patches all over the place. These are iron deposits from multiple bleeds that he had had silently up until that time. Still functioning as a high-level corporate lawyer, um, uh, you know, really extremely successful. So he was only 60 when this happened, um, and he had something called amyloid angiopathy. Uh, these represent uh, all kinds of little vessels that have been hurt leaked blood uh, because of this. Um, and in his case, because that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, it probably reflects Alzheimer's disease, it took about five or six years before his full dementia um, developed and presented. And he eventually died and he was confirmed to have Alzheimer's disease only uh, with, this, uh, with these bleeds. And um, um, his, whole, his whole course was about seven years from the time of the, of the onset. Now we can actually image amyloid in the brain. This is the high-tech stuff, so that we can not just guess. So I guess that it's there because I know those, those black dots mean there's amyloid in those vessels. But now we don't have to guess anymore. There are actually positron emission tomography um, techniques using um, radio labeling of ligands that can be uh, manufactured to um, seek out and, and, and attach to amyloid in the brain, and you can see uptake, um, so, the bio, so the biochemical affinity in the brain. And this is what you see on a PET scan, and this is an example of someone who had mild, both of these people had mild cognitive impairment, which meant that they had memory problems, primarily memory problems, they were amnestic. Um, they were otherwise still functioning okay, but they were at high risk of you know, progressing eventually to Alzheimer's disease, maybe 50% within three to five years will have demented, becoming more impaired in their memory and having at least one other area of cognitive dysfunction, enough to interfere with their independence, usually instrumental activity of daily independence. So what this shows, when people first come to you with mild cognitive impairment, you're not sure who's going to decline and who's going to be stable. But here's an example of a person who has, here with the red, as you can see, this is uptake of amyloid. This person had amyloid deposited in their brain or in the vessels. We're not sure if it's both, they don't accept both. If you look at their brain scan, you can see here is their memory area. 
Um, and it's kind of shrunken. It's, it's supposed to actually fill the space. And their brain is a little shrunken. Everywhere we see black, it means that spinal fluid is filling gaps that shouldn't be there. It should be a nice, tight fit. Your, your brain should fit nicely into your skull. And when you see that not happening, it usually means there's atrophy. Which often starts, by the way, to some extent, in all of us, around 50. So uh, the amazing thing is that um, the human being in the second half of the lifespan um, seems to cope as well as it does when you think of all the dangers, insults, and other things that go on. You can see the ventricles are bigger as well. So this is a person who progressed to Alzheimer's disease within uh, two years. By contrast, this, these two people started off the same in their appearance, in terms of the cognitive functioning profile. But you can see their brains are different. You know, the hippocampus here, this is the memory area, looks pretty good. Even the brain doesn't look all that shrunken. And there's no uptake of amyloid. There's a little bit in the, in the white matter, but it, you know, so not much uptake. This person stayed stable. So you can actually use imaging. I mean, you know, the problem is, this costs, um, I think it's about twenty-five or $3,000 in the States, maybe $8,000 in the future, something like that, now that it's approved, whether the labels is approved. Um, so that's kind of expensive to do for every person who want to know this, right? But um, you begin to see that there will be a tier system, a, a tier two, a two tier system of people who could pay for this, people who can't pay for this, um, and how does a public health system deal with uh, this kind of expensive technology? I won't dwell on this too much to say, except to say that amyloid angiopathy. Um, is shown here. So what happens is that amyloid, these are vessels in the brain, this is microscopic, um, actually it's too photon. <coughs> it shows these little red uh, bits, that's actually amyloid starting to gather around the wall of an arterial. This is what it looks like cross-sectionally, you can actually stain it in a way that you can see it. And you can see that it's beginning to infiltrate, it's going to destroy that vessel. Um, now the amyloid bleeds tend to be in certain parts of the brain. This is in an Alzheimer population, you see it clustered at the back of the brain, a little bit in the front. And in people who present with the hemorrhages first, it's kind of the same. It tends to accumulate more at the back um, and at the front. And when you do an amyloid scan, this is an amyloid scan that's in an Alzheimer population. And the back, the very back part of the brain is relatively spared, whereas in the people with the amyloid angiopathy, there just seems to be um, a particular form of how Alzheimer's happens. It's more at the back of the brain. So there are ways that we can even see different distributions of amyloid in the brain and they tell us about different uh, ways that disease expresses itself. So that's just to sort of show you that there are some new developments in imaging that are going to, that could allow us to know in life what people have. But again, I come back to the fact that in autopsy studies, people can have end stage Alzheimer's disease and not in Now let's talk a little bit about small vessel pathology because um, this is something I'm particularly interested in and because it's actually another way that the brain ages. This first started to be something people were aware of through population aging studies. So it's where you just take a bunch of folks through a census and you call them up and you say, hey, would you be willing to come in and have some testing done and have a scan done? And you're not selecting them on the basis of any um, you know, disease entity. No one will really screen out people because they're demented or you know, if there's a major illness or they're going to be dead. Um, because of some other illness. So, you know, generally, community dwelling, healthy adults. In this case, over 65. This, is, this was done like 15 years ago. And what they noticed was that a large number of people had uh, little holes in their brain, which they call silent strokes. So, it turns out that strokes, what we know of, or what we think of as strokes, the ones that present with a physical disability, for example, are only the tip of the iceberg. And in fact, when they define these little strokes as three millimeter uh, little tiny lesions, but you know, big enough that they were real, um, that you see on a certain type of MRI scan as little holes, 28% uh, of people over 65 had these present. And this was a substantial study, almost 4,000 individuals. Mean age was 75, and it was in the cardiovascular health service in the US. Now the frequency of their presence depends on age, so in the Framingham study, um, these were the children of the original people, average age of 62, 
had these present. So it, they increase with each decade. We now have Canadian data on this. There's something called the Pure Mind Study. And it's coming out in average age around 63, 64. The people from age 40 to um, 70, I think, are being surveyed. That about 14% of people have these silent strokes. So they're about 10 times as prevalent as over strokes. And even if you had none, at, you know, none present, at, none present at baseline, but you follow people for four or five years, you can see it develop. And in fact, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about little holes, uh, you know, for example, there or sort of maybe there. Uh, sometimes these can be something called the vertical lot of spaces. But I think you know, there's an example of a little hole. Um, it looks hyper intense on a certain sequence. It looks hypo intense on this sequence of MR. So when you do an MRI scan, you do different um, applications of radio frequency pulses so you can see different properties of the brain. And um, when you see um, something in the brain that's CSF, remember I told you this is the way the spinal fluid is produced in the ventricles, and this is CSF bathing the brain, uh, that usually means um, in this sequence that you know, there's a hole there that's CSF in intensity. So it's a hole. There's no brain there. So if you have a lot of these, you are interrupting pathways, even if they're deep in the brain. Um, on a different sequence, they show up as hyperintense. So I'm going to be talking about something called hyperintensities, white matter hyperintensities, or cobalt hyperintensities, because uh, when MRI started to be available in the 1980s, it turned out that um, the of elder brain showed these hyperintensities. We didn't know what they meant. And we're still not entirely sure what they, what they mean. But probably it's better not to have them. So with respect to those covert little silent strokes, so to speak, um, the idea is that they really aren't silent, they're just covert, because, and this has been reproduced by various studies, in the Rotterdam study we did the same sort of thing, they followed people for four years. If you had them at baseline, you were more likely to de decline cognitively on various measures. You had twice the risk of aversion dementia, five times the risk of stroke, and even after you corrected for the vascular risk factors, you still had a greater risk of stroke. <coughs> so it, they probably represent an active disease. You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of the silent strokes, or the silent vascular disease. And what is this disease? This just sort of shows you an example where there's blockage of an arterial, occlusion of blockage. I won't go into all the kind of details, but you know, this is what it looks like at technology. <coughs> That's one way um, through changes in the vessels are driven particularly by <coughs> hypertension, but it can also just happen. Another thing I think that's way under the radar is just with <coughs> aging and what happens in the brain with the <coughs> modeling of vessels under various kinds of stresses, but even just getting old, uh, what happens is that the arteries start to um, become tortuous. This is what hopefully many people in this room have in the way their are penetrating arteries look <coughs> like in the brain. Um, starting to get a little tortuous here, getting even more tortuous here, eventually so tortuous that you don't get any blood flow. <coughs> so there's another way you can end up blocking um, the blood flow and having a hole develop because with these penetrating arteries, as I'll show you in a moment, there's no rescue. You're solo. You're going solo. You've got nothing around you to preserve, um, uh, uh, preserve that tissue. So if this blocks, you get a cylinder. You get a hole. And it's got depth. That's why it can be bad for you. Now here's an example of what the vascular um, uh, network looks like in Alzheimer's disease. This shows you sort of the network in the brain. You've got the surface of many vessels overlapping a really complex <coughs> network. And actually, you can block one of those and not have as much consequence as if you block a penetrating artery, because the neighbors take care of each other there. Here's what you want to look like. This is what an arterial looks like in, in Alzheimer's disease. So how can you? pretend that Alzheimer's disease is not also a vascular disease. It is. It's just been under the radar for a lot of, for a lot of people. Even the animal models of Alzheimer's disease, when you put a gene in and you um, see what, you know, how the plaques develop, they kind of ignore the vessels. If you look at the vessels, they're actually very abnormal in the most models of Alzheimer's disease. So these are the penetrating arteries I mean. This is a side of the brain and this is looking at it coronally, like you're slicing bread. And you can see all these blood vessels going in. Um, so if you block one of them, you get a hole. But you can also see that there's an area here where there's not too much supply. And this is actually called a watershed area. It's where 
this part of the brain is not very well covered by the circulation. And so it's very vulnerable if there's hypotension or if there's a cardiac arrest or if there's um, uh, some other uh, reason that your brain is not, you've got sleep apnea, and, you know, you've got pauses and so forth. There's problems with uh, circulation in this area. The other thing that's been completely under the radar is the whole venous side of the system. So this shows you the medullary veins, the venous drainage of the brain. And there's a deep system, and a superficial system, and a transcerebral system. It turns out that this gets up to mischief as well in aging. And it's, some of this work was published in the mid-90s, and has been completely, not completely, but fairly ignored. Um, so another kind of white matter disease that we see in people is shown here, and it's called white matter because you can see that um, this is the white matter part of the brain, this is the cortex part of the brain, and this is where all the fibers are going back and forth. And you can see that there's hyperintensity here. This is a, a CT scan, it, it shows up as hypodense, but it's abnormal. It should be, you know, the white matter should look sort of like this. It's darker, here it's whiter. And we do see this in about 20% of people. It's an extreme, but it, we do see it in elderly people. And it's, it's bothered individuals for the last 25 years since we've been sort of doing MRI scans because sometimes these people have that impaired cognitively. But when you have this much um, disease, often people have problems with balance. Um, and they do have, they're slowed in their thinking. They have, they have what we call executive deficits. So this is another kind of um, white matter disease, not the little focal holes or little focal spots. In the cardiovascular health survey, if you talk about focal spots that are just hypertense but not holes, right up to that very confluent abnormality I showed you, here are the, here's the data, 4% of people don't have any. It's even less than I said, so it's not 20% don't in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, when we try to find people who have no focal hypertensities, none of the other lesions, uh, it's very hard to find. It's probably 5 to 10 percent. 20 percent have extensive disease, and they're the ones who do have more uh, problems with gait, dexterity, and cognition, mostly psychomotor speed. They're just kind of slower. They can't move the task. Um, they, the reaction time may not be so good. Um, and, uh, and yet, um, some of the standard cognitive tests, their memory isn't so bad. They may have little retrieval problems, but with the queuing, we can remember reasonably well. Um, and there may be some sort of threshold of amount of this you need before you start to see these effects. So I'm just pointing out that um, from small to big amounts uh, of this uh, um, disease is, is very um, common. And yet, we don't even really understand what it is. Now, having white matter hypertensities is not good for you. So for example, um, it's associated with a risk of, greater risk of stroke, of cognitive decline, of dementia, and of death. And in fact, in the Alzheimer's Disease Neurology Initiative, if you have white matter disease and you've got MCI, you're more likely to decline into dementia as well as having natural amyloid. And also, if you're unlucky enough to have a stroke and you have white matter hypertensities, um, you're, um, you're going to, uh, actually, you're going to do more poorly. So I, I, should just, I should just point out that these are, these are the numbers that express that three times the risk of stroke, twice the risk of dementia, twice the risk of death, and then all of these uh, cognitive problems. But if you actually have a stroke and you have white matter disease, or a hemorrhage and you have white matter disease, you're more likely to die and be impaired. You're less likely to recover. And you're more likely to dement. So this is not innocent bystander pathology. And I'll just mention here that we believe that this is actually a disease of the veins. And where it is seen is shown here. This is a cross-sectional, sorry, a, a axial view of the brain, sliced this way. This is coronal, and this is sideways. And this is where you see most of these uh, abnormalities distributed. And then what we've done is we've superimposed a, a painstakingly, it took my colleague a week, to draw all of the venous drainage system of the brain at, at one individual. And it exactly maps on where you see this uh, pathology. And it turns out that there's another aging change that happens and you start seeing it in your 50s and 60s. And that is that the veins start to uh, form collagen uh, and probably a, a stress reaction to chronic under perfusion. 
So this part of the brain is relatively less well diffused than the cortex and the other white matter. And as I mentioned, there are those special uh, watershed areas where in particular um, you don't get good uh, perfusion. So most of these white matter changes start back here and up here. And what we think is that the veins are getting stressed, they start to form collagen, they start to harden. So you get hardening of the veins and they start to leak. So what this um, hyperintensity is, is actually fluid in the brain, we call it edema fluid, and it sits there for a long time and gradually hurts the brain. It slows down information processing, gradually hurts the brain. And in fact, these are pathology examples showing here um, white matter change in this particular person who unfortunately climbed the ladder and fell and died. Um, and here are the veins that are showing either occlusion or thickening as a, as a correlate of that abnormality. Um, this is important in how amyloid gets out of the brain because amyloid is going along the blood vessels as well as the different pathways. So there's degrading of the enzyme, uh, by enzymes of am amyloid beta, there's some capillary transfer, um, there are cells in the brain that help to get rid of it, and then there's this drainage along the vessels, arterioles and the, the venules. And when you start to get disease on the walls, you start to get problems clearing it, as well as destruction of the vessels and changes in the vessels. In the case of the venous disease, we think that's happening independently, but it may interfere with the circulation of amyloid out of the brain. And in older onset Alzheimer's disease, it's clearance of amyloid that matters, not overproduction. So this is where you know, the venous disease or the vascular disease this starts to be potentially interactive with uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, um, I guess we need some time. Look, is this supposed to go to a what? Or with including questions? Or we'll one thirty. But whenever oh, you're okay, ready. Whenever you want to go. Okay, good. No, I want to leave time for questions. So now I want to talk about um, just hypertension and cognitive decline because I think this is really a <coughs> emerging story, and uh, always use it as an opportunity to remind anybody in the room that they have to know what their blood pressure is, they have to make sure it's under control, and I hope by the time I'm finished, you will you know, get up there and exercise, and you'll also make sure that your blood pressure is controlled. So here's why. First of all, there's this fascinating study that's been going on for years based on Japanese men uh, who agreed to be followed for you know their lifetime, um, starting in the late 40s, and uh, Peter will know the people involved. Uh, Lon White has just recently come up with an interesting new observation showing the protective effects of a particular hypertensive agent. But in these um, almost 4,000 people followed, this is like 40 years, they found that untreated hypertension in midlife, and back then when they started, there weren't great medications for high blood pressure. They were toxic substances that you would use to bring the blood pressure down, and people did it and it, it, it helped when they uh, did do it. And now we have much more tolerable medications, right? Uh, the diuretics being a huge breakthrough many, many years ago, it's still very effective. So what they found is that they had untreated hypertension, we're talking like above 180 sort of thing. Um, if it was the systolic above, actually above 160, uh, in a group of individuals who died, they had uh, a greater likelihood of dementia. So five times the likelihood of being demented when they died if they had systolic hypertension. They had four times if it was diastolic. But what's, so you just think, well, they've got a lot of you know, vascular disease and you know, maybe they've had little strokes. This was not related to strokes. This was related to just the hypertension corrected for the things. And what was even more interesting is that the systolic hypertension correlated with neuritic plaques, those are actually Alzheimer's plaques, and the diastolic to tangles, which is the other pathology you see in Alzheimer's disease, the tangles and plaques in the hippocampus. So it seemed to be correcting for everything else that there was a kind of direct relationship between the hypertension and the Alzheimer's pathology. Let me show you something, show you something similar. And this just makes the same point. I'm going to not dwell on it. It's just a, another study which shows you know, something very similar. You're looking at um, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease just by having um, untreated hypertension. That alone, that alone should make people, so if you survive not having a stroke, which hypertension can increase your chances of, or your heart attack, 
which kills you young, so you don't get to have the stroke, and you don't get to have Alzheimer's disease. If you happen to survive all that, then you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, more likely. You know, still only twice the risk, but you know, still. Not only that, if you look at people with hypertension and just cognitive function, not actual dementia, which is a more severe stage or you know, Alzheimer's disease, midlife hypertension is associated with lower level of uh, cognitive function on various tests. <coughs> There's a little interesting twist in this, and that is that as you get demented, your blood pressure actually goes down. Now, I don't know whether that, you know, there's a kind of physiological reason that most of that is Alzheimer's or just what, and um, people aren't quite sure why that is, but it is something you have to be careful about because having hypertension is not good, but having hypotension is also not good. And in one study, they got away with this. I don't know how they would ever do it. It was like published in the last few years ago, and they didn't treat people with blood pressure as well. They were placebo. They were randomized to placebo or treatment. And uh, we would never get into ethics now, but they did. And they proved a point, which is on the MMSC, which is a little mental status exam that you will know. Um, it just does it's out of 30, and it you know, asks for orientation and memory and questions. 4.3 uh, people had declined, four, there was four times the risk of, I'm sorry, there was a decline of 4.3 points in the untreated cases versus two points in people treated with uh, hypertensives. Um, showing that um, the, uh, you know, our treatment with hypertensive was beneficial. Now, that has turned out to be one of the few studies that can actually show this. And I think it's because they actually had a placebo group. Because if you start having you know, more or less treatment, it's harder to show these differences. But it was done once, so I've ever been done again. Um, and yet it did make a point that treatment makes a difference. Um, you can also show in other ways that if you treat people with hypertension, they will show less decline on things like the ability to generate words in a minute. So these are the patients uh, untreated, um, medically treated, these are the people who are treated. So there's more decline in a task like that, or immediate recall of a word list. So even on like cognitive, individual cognitive functions, there seems to be some benefit. Generally speaking, it tends to be what we call the executive functions, however, that benefit most from uh, blood pressure uh, intervention. These are things like um, speed, and this little test where you switch between numbers and letters, and you look at mental flexibility. Uh, even in small samples, they showed that um, uh, you know, blood pressure increases are associated with wasted performance on these tasks. And then uh, they showed that uh, hypertension showed faster decline, diabetes showed um, problems with processing spree, speed, and also more decline in instrumental activities. These are all just different studies, independent studies, that keep saying the same thing. Also, hypertension increases and is associated with the white matter hypertensity. So one of the risk factors for white matter hypertensity, which I've now talked about, is actually having hypertension. And that's probably because it increases the stress on the vessels and also the hypoxia around the, uh, the, the ventricles. Um, and uh, this was actually shown in a study where they, they, they monitored this very carefully over a period of several years. Um, in a, yet another study, they showed that um, the blood systolic blood pressure and the white matter lesion load um, you know, were correlated a little differently in many women, but showing the same trend. So as you get up to higher ones, you get higher levels, you get more of the white matter. It's more of a brain stress. Uh, importantly, there's one study that showed that treatment with an antihypertensive medication seemed to reduce the, um, the amount of white matter disease uh, over a period of about three years. They showed that 12% of people uh, developed uh, new white matter hypertensities, that that was reduced um, uh, by 43% the people who were treated with a drug called Flintro, which is a base inhibitor. Um, and that the overall volume was reduced, um, especially in the people who had more severe disease. So it looked like you can, you can actually modulate how it increases by treating the hypertension. Mm -hmm. And here's another interesting um, example now of how imaging is starting to come in this, on the scene. And this was in, uh, there's a study in Boston where they had a, over 100 people, and they were volunteers from the community, and they um, 
they looked at associations between blood pressure, cholesterol, and uh, glucose, um, glucose levels on, on thinning in, in different uh, on structural measures of the brain. And what's really intriguing is that the blood pressure factor, they um, combined and you know, looked at these in different ways, the blood pressure factor seemed to be associated with thinning of the frontal, parietal, and temporal region in both hemispheres, which are exactly the regions, regions that are targeted by Alzheimer's disease, that show up as thin, uh, thin in Alzheimer's disease, also something called the posterior syndrome. Cholesterol uh, was a little more distributed, but some of it uh, was similar. And then glucose, interestingly, seemed to be associated more with you know, frontal, um, so this is the corpus callosum, so the frontal fraction. This was a small study, but you know, kind of suggestive but indicating that these different vascular risk factors may actually be affecting the brain in different regions because of vulnerabilities that we don't fully understand yet. And then with respect to can treatment ameliorate it, I mentioned already the Sister study, which is this one, one of the most compelling. The rest are less convincing, but they tend to show a little bit of tendency towards um, less likelihood of uh, becoming defensive if you're on uh, hypertensive treatment. So they're, they're kind of in the same direction, but not as as you might like, except for this one, which had a placebo loop. <laughs> so finally, I want to talk about physical activity and a few other sort of social factors, especially for this audience. And uh, this is kind of an intensive uh, slide of print, but just because I think it's, it's a summation of a whole bunch of um, studies and other interesting. First of all, showing that um, if you do a meta-analysis where you look at uh, a number of network imaging studies, um, they show that participation in physical activity seems to be associated with bigger brain volumes in the prefrontal region and in the hippocampus, the memory area, so executive memory. Also, um, longitudinal studies show that um, in people who are more physically active earlier in life, you, 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 see this, you see the same thing. And there are now more and more studies that are suggesting that physical activity does have this, um, it, it has a converging kind of robust association with some of the same regions that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. One of the things I think is important about some of this kind of work is it shows that the brain retains some plasticity well into late ad adulthood with, with respect to physical activity. I think this is actually quite remarkable. That you, you could actually have an effect on your brain even if you start exercising at 80. So there's, it's kind of like quitting smoking. It helps you no matter what decade, it's better for you, right? Um, not as good as if you don't smoke in the first place, and I'll show you in a moment, not as good as if you're active in teenage, which is very worrisome these days, but um, nevertheless uh, helpful. And you know, it's relatively modest amounts. I mean, some of the work, I don't think this is adequately explored yet, but it looked like, you know, people have talked about uh, 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three times a week might be beneficial enough. And this is, um, the message is that it's even, even people who are at high risk of developing um, Alzheimer's. E4 people, for example, E4 positive people, seem to show, I mean, in some ways they show relatively greater benefit because they're at greater risk. So it's almost, it's good for everybody, right? There aren't too many things like that, good for everybody. And this is just to bring home the point, these are a, a number of different studies all showing the same trend, so it's your better, it's better if you're left here, favoring physical activity, several studies that, you know, a decade ago, many of them. Association between physical activity and Alzheimer's disease with respect to cohorts. Parkinson's, same thing. Same sort of, uh, same sort of uh, finding, more or less. And of course, perhaps not surprisingly, also for prevention of vascular dementia. So I'm just pointing out that in the common dementias, taken as separate diseases, not counting the fact that many people with Alzheimer's have Parkinson's and vascular, and vascular have Parkinson's, and Parkinson's is vascular, I mean, it's crazy. They're all mixed up together. But they all show some benefit um, for physical exercise. But the challenge is, how do you get people to exercise when they've got Parkinson's disease, or they're cognitively impaired, or they've had a stroke? So I think the challenge for us is not just to get everybody out there capable of exercising and exercising, but providing opportunities for people who can't do the normal, you know, running around the gym. Adaptation to individual needs, I think, is really important. And this just shows you in Apple E4 carriers um, that, again, I won't go through all these details, 
um, you are uh, you're at very high risk of Alzheimer's disease, especially with two alleles of the apple of four, um, and you benefit even more by exercise. So that, there have been a few studies suggesting the same thing. This brings in the issue of exercise and Mediterranean diet. So diet's important too, and I'm just I'm almost finished now. Um, and this just basically shows you that a combination of Mediterranean diet and a high level of physical activity is best. None is worse, and various combinations are good too. So they're all illustrating that it's not just, it's a, it's, it is lifestyle, and it's not just um, exercise. And so this is where the social sciences and humanities become really important in terms of how do we make society make this possible for people, how do we incentivize people, how do we uh, reward people, how do we stop kids from becoming obese because they're sitting in playing with computers all day. Um, and this is, a, for this particular group, over the life course, uh, this was a nice study that uh, Laura Middleton, who's now at the University of Waterloo, did with um, uh, Dr. Yaffe in, in California. And they, it was a cross-sectional study, but they looked at physical activity by report from different decades of life, almost 10,000 women, and they were looking at their um, cognitive uh, abilities in, um, in, in their 80s. Okay? They adjusted for a whole bunch of things. And basically what they found was that people benefited from every decade of physical activity, but the most influential decrease in risk of cognitive impairment at age 85 was actually people who exercised at the age. However, you know, it was beneficial in every decade, and I think it, it just, again, is an alarm bell for what is happening in our society. Um, because, uh, a lot of the teens are not getting it. There are different ways that this may be. Um, we, uh, we don't understand why this is so effective. I mean, honestly, if we could put it in a pill, it would be marketed at a very high price, which Peter would object to. But nevertheless, <laughs> it increases blood flow, has effects on some growth factors, neurotransmitter function, increases testosterone, increases insulin resistance, all those good things. And these can really on improving, you know, hippocampal regeneration and sort of activity to sort of keep up with uh, with aging changes. And it also may actually decrease the amyloid. Now, this is, you know, there are a lot of other things going on. Even not having enough sleep can increase amyloid. Obstructive sleep apnea. I mean, this is another whole risk factor that has been under the radar. Finally, it's not just that. Um, I think I think physical activity in the social context probably is even more effective. This is just a quick. Um, you know, summary that's saying social network factors may also be important in maintaining brain health. So they, this is the Chicago group, and they, they looked at social networks, you know, kind of people you were related to and you saw a lot, and then engagement in various activities, religious services, going to museums, participating in groups, etc. And they showed that more social resources predicted how much you decline cognitively, cognitively over five years in this elder population, um, and also the number of work networks you were involved with. These were all factors, right? Now, they're all a big gamish, and uh, we, it's hard to sort of um, parcel them out, but you know, exercising in a group um, and having you know, family exercising with you or friends or whatever probably is giving extra oomph to uh, what you're doing, but still, each one of them uh, may be independently important. And this is just showing that this, not, not every single person has, every single study has found this, but quite a few have shown this social um, aspect um, in terms of networking as being important. Um, I'll finish just with this um, particular uh, example of social networking, doing and being able to do things. This is a young woman who had a stroke in her 40s, late 40s, um, lost all her speech, and was right hemiplegic. I thought she was going to die, but she's going to walk again. I made a mistake. Uh, I was young in my career, and I told her she was unlikely to walk again. So when she came in at six months into my office with a walking stick, quite triumphantly, she said, see, <laughs> don't you ever do that again. So I don't. But there are some people who really don't recover uh, walking, or I know many fewer that used to be the case. So her marriage broke up. She was a mother of four children. Her husband um, it was hard to take. Um, she continued to mother the children. She's given permission to show this picture. She eventually met um, uh, another person who was actually a phasic. They started going out together, living together, doing things together. But he doesn't like to go to Florida. 
And she does. So last year, on her own, this woman has a severe corpus aphasia, which she can sort of communicate you know, very um, telegraphically. She's got no use of her right arm, and she limps quite a lot, because she's got a heavy right leg. She went to Florida, she went to this dolphin park, she was swimming with the dolphins. I didn't show this one, but there's one picture where the two dolphins are kissing her cheeks, uh -huh. and a smile that you wouldn't believe. And the thing that's really interesting is you don't really know that she's in a good kind of break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sort of an example of someone who managed to get her network together again, who managed to compensate for very severe parents, and to do something she wanted to do, and communing, you know, with our other fellow creatures, um, intelligent uh, life on the planet, um, it was just kind of a nice putting together of all the things that we need to do. But the courage and determination of this woman is amazing. So in conclusion, preventing cognitive decline, preserving optimal brain structure and function should be a primary goal for us as a society. I mean, it's a good investment in the future. I've, I've told you how uh, terrible some of these diseases are. And I, you know, basically, Alzheimer's and stroke also generate mood disorders and uh, you know, behavioral problems. And mental disorders such as uh, severe depression, they, they're a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Bipolar kids are high risk of cardiovascular diseases. I mean, these are all intertwined. Modern imaging is revealing that the brain and its vasculature are very sensitive to these vascular risks. And yet, the good news is they're responsive to amelioration and control at any age. You benefit at any age. You start at any age. It's still helpful. But there's more damage the, you know, the, the later you start. And of course, there are genetic and other risk factors. But there's, there is something we can all do. So lifelong regular daily exercise should be a key societal and personal goal for everybody. As soon as I say you to <laughs> Midlife hypertension shrinks the brain, increases stroke and like other disease. Hypertension at any age is not good for you, especially for executive functioning. It's a major driver of atherosclerosis, white matter disease, arterial or probably venular disease, and Alzheimer's pathology. And since comorbid Alzheimer's and cerebrovascular disease is the commonest substrate of dementia, hypertension control remains a major health care priority. Now, if we could just get some of these things right, we'd be doing a huge service to our society. But how you do that you know, is, very, uh, is very complicated. I think Peter probably talked about the transgenerational school concept, too, where I mean, I think that's a wonderful example of social networking where older people are you know, put to work you know, to help younger people um, to learn. And you know, those kinds of experiments and those kinds of activities are ones that we need to uh, replicate and build and, and uh, make more available. So I'll just acknowledge those types, types of support. And I think we do have about 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Yeah? I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I just wonder, like, even talks here in the room and said that probably a family physician can just diagnose the dementia. Should everyone go in that and get their brain and figure out what kind of dementia they have? And there's drugs that different. Well that's a very no, that's a very good question. I mean I think I think that may that day may come when we have something we can we can we can do you know in terms of specific treatment. But I think it's more that the the, the family doctors are are the sort of custodians to some extent of our general health. And I think what I've been talking about is managing of blood pressure and diabetes and cholesterol and encouraging exercise and diet and so forth. And so the more that the family doctors and the family health teams can you know, promote wellness and prevent disease, um, the better it will be for everybody. And in that sense, they have a big job to do. With respect to people who who have symptoms or are at risk, and more and more now, sorry, you want to stand up? Or, I'll stand up <laughs> so I can see you. Um, the more, um, you know, we're getting more and more referrals from young individuals, you know, 40s and 50s, who have both parents with Alzheimer's disease or other conditions, or one parent, or you know, many family members on one side, and so on, who are worried. Um, understandably so, and, and family doctors are, and we're, we're seeing, in fact, my practice is changing now. I don't, I don't really just see regular like, garden variety um, folks who fit the criteria for Alzheimer's disease with or without white matter disease. The family doctors are pretty much managing those because medications have been around for about 50 years. There are no new ones, really. 
um, that are effective, and these drugs themselves are modestly effective. They slow some of the symptoms down. There's a second drug that came along that you can add on to that can only help. But it's not, uh, it's not that complicated. There's a lot of them doing that. So, so yeah, so I think preventing stroke is usually important. Managing stroke after it's happened, preventing stroke by understanding what a TIA is and making sure that it gets managed right away. Those are the kinds of things that family doctors play a huge role in. And in maintaining stroke prevention therapies thereafter, you know, when, once a person has been identified at, at very high risk, which is the case if you have a transient ischemic attack, if you have a threatened stroke, or even a minor stroke, you're at risk of recurrence. If you have atrial fibrillation, you're at risk of stroke. If you have heart disease, Use, but you know, you know, caring for diabetes, all of these are actually managed with, by family doctors, sometimes with specialty care, but they're being special, there are not specialists to see people on a regular basis, so it's, it's teamwork between the specialists and the, elsewhere, and, and the uh, family doctors. Now, with respect to where things are going, there may be prevention therapies in the future, and what's happening in the field is that people are moving into earlier stages of what may be identifiable, identifiable as Alzheimer's disease. So even right now, for people who have a family form of Alzheimer's disease, we have got a 50-50 chance of getting it because you are, you've got a gene mutation that overproduces the abnormal uh, A-beta, this amyloid uh, protein. Right now, there's a study that's about to be starting on people who are, um, they have the mutation, and the 10 years before the disease would normally develop in their family, because if you have the mutation, you have a 100% chance you're going to express the disease, Usually starts in the 40s. So you're going to take people who are in their 30s, and they're going to be giving them um, an, an antibody against them to see if you can delay and prevent the disease. Can you keep up with it? Can you keep removing it as fast as it's being overproduced? Now that's a different disease than old, older people, right? So it's a little more challenging for older people who just had spectacular failures of the amyloid um, uh, antibody passive immunization uh, given to people who are already in the dementia stage, or people that are saying, well, they may have to go earlier. Um, there's even a, a thought about a study where people who have a family history, and they're APOE4, so they're at risk. You would do an amyloid scan to determine that they have amyloid in the brain, and they might be in their 50s. And you say, would you like to do this? You might get it, you might not get it, but we'll see whether we can prevent you from developing symptoms that might not start for 10 or 20 years. <laughs> so we're actually starting to be in that phase, but I don't know that we've got the right drugs yet to do that. You know? Right now we're infusing uh, proteins into people's veins, and you know, we, we're not sure what we're doing, right? So I think right now there's not a lot we can do, and I think, I don't, I don't mean that in a negative sense, I mean, there's all that we can do to, to do the vascular health part, right, which is huge. Assuming you've done all that, and there's still some chance that you know, you're going to get the disease because it's still kind of overwhelming in that, you know, most exercising, most mentally active. I didn't talk about mental activity. That's another whole you know, phase of kind of commercial development and also just uh, importance, which is keeping mentally active, right? Active education, association of low education and high risk. Uh, that's almost a whole other lecture, cognitive reserve, right? But um, I think that uh, right now there's just there's nothing specific that someone can give you. Um, you know, yes, there's dietary advice, and a few they have some views on this. There's a lot of things that um, might be important, like omega three intake and so on. But mostly, it's Mediterranean diet is about fruits and vegetables and fish. <laughs> Get it naturally, and probably it's probably better for your body than taking pills. Right? So, Peter. Comments? <laughs> Answer the question. <laughs> no, no uh, Sandy, uh, first, uh, I just wanted to say what Lynn said. You're absolutely amazing in the work you do in the world, and I think uh, combined with um, Vladimir, who's a little generation ahead, to heading off the World Federation of Neurology, we'll, we'll have Canada um, hopefully influence the world in a somewhat left route direction, I think. Um, because I think. Um, even in your talk, all the pieces say that this is almost as much a public health 
problem as it is a pharmaceutical model. So to the extent we see public health as a more left philosophy and making money out of expensive drugs that don't work, or right-wing strategy work, I think in sync. But it does uh, speak to the, the role that you're going to play with the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance, specifically positioning Toronto and Canada in this space as it evolves. I just wanted to make a plug for January being um, Alzheimer's Awareness um, Month. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come to a question. And also to highlight um, Tiffany Chow's new book. Is that her front cover? Uh, I it took it off. I, I've been reading it. So yeah. I took off. It's got a wonderful picture of Tiffany. <laughs> Tiffany. You Hawaiian, buy the book just for the picture. Of Hawaiian. It, it is. It's, 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 um, and uh, <clears throat> if you want to uh, participate in the launch of the book, uh, come to. Uh, uh, it's today. Come to um, uh, Ben. Um, McNally. McNally, thank you, I'm used to with him, on Bay Street. And uh, come early, because uh, Tiffany is of Hawaiian origin, so the first thing we're going to do is hula hoops, <laughs> which of course is very consistent with your, your message. She's good. <laughs> but the, the message uh, from the Canadian Society and from the Alzheimer's Disease International in this month and in this year is stigma, uh, destigmatizing or addressing this kind of social um, perspective. So at least a question for you or anybody else in the audience who's interested. From the Canadian perspective, what what is this process of destigmatization all about? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a huge issue. And um, the word dementia, just like, you know, depression or mental health or schizophrenia, um, is terrifying. And sometimes it prevents people from seeking help. And sometimes, uh, you know, case of depression, uh, people will kill themselves before they even seek help. Um, so it is a very big issue, and it's sort of driving the new DSM-5, as you know, so that they are now avoiding the term dementia, and um, substituting, I think in some ways, a more obscure term, but nevertheless, this is what they're trying to do. And so people will have major or mild neurocognitive disorders. Now, how many in this room understand what a neurocognitive disorder is? How many people understand what cognitive means? I, I take for granted that everyone knows what cognitive means. Everyone says, what do you mean cognitive? And I think, oh my god. What do I mean cognitive? So I, I, think that the, I think there's sort of two sides to this. It's very complex because on the one hand, it's stigmatizing and um, therefore um, humiliating and embarrassing and difficult for people at all stages and in all cultures, although some cultures are very good at this, it's just aging, right? It comes to mind and you just kind of absorb it into your family system. And, and in, in Toronto, we have many cultures where that's what happens. It would be a matter of honor to continue to care for the most disabled person in the home. And I also see couples who are unbelievably amazing in how they continue to care for um, a loved one who's very disabled. Um, so on the one hand, there's this stigma that you're talking about. On the other hand, there's also access to services. <clears throat> it was interesting in the first rounds of the DSM-5, which was open um, access in a sense, anyone in the world could comment on some of the proposals. Some of the um, organizations associated with diseases and with sort of disability issues said, wait a minute, if you take away the word dementia, I'm not going to get my disability. So there's sort of an aspect to, you know, everybody has to catch up with this. We're going to destigmatize. We also have to figure out rules of engagement for people who are genuinely in need of help and financial assistance who mm -hmm. now don't meet some sort of, you know, stigma criteria. Right? So I don't know what the right answer to this is. I think that uh, we avoid using the word dementia because a lot of careful nuance in of it um, because it can be shocking to people and upsetting to families. On the other hand, it is, it's, you know, it's got a definition that has to do with you know, dependence and, and, and needing help and so it serves a certain kind of purpose you need to bring it home to caregivers who may not realize what's in it. And so I don't think it's a question of just destigmatizing. I think it's that we all have to realize that we're in a, an aging society, um, and also that it can affect young people. And uh, 
it's not people's fault that they, that they have these conditions. Um, I saw a, you know, a remarkable case yesterday of a person who had head trauma, um, wasn't quite the same after that, in the early 40s, and then had um, an infection that ended up with severe sepsis and was sick in the hospital in ICU for several months. Comes out of this with cognitive impairment and some funny movement disorders and looks really strange as a person. You know, like, you know, twitches and, and looks, um, you know, looks like, you know, if you want to be sort of prejudiced because we're so driven by appearance, right? And you've got two things. You've got people who look normal, but they're not normal, and they run into problems. And you've got people who don't look normal, and they're treated as stupid when they're not. So this person, you know, the, the medical system is calling this person by because work. Because the movement disorder didn't fit into exactly uh, what was going on. So we looked at his scan. This is an example where scanning uh, actually is very important. This person had injury to the brain. And well, the, other thing, the other thing he had is he had moments of aggression and, and discontrol, which didn't seem to be triggered, that would just happen. Um, and yet, he was getting some rehab, he was sort of coming along. So anyway, on his scan, he's got bilateral amygdala lesions, which is the emotion area of the brain. He's got shrunken hippocampi, the worst on the right than the left. And he came and said, do you have trouble remembering people's faces and places? And I said, yeah, how did you know that? So in fact, he was being called a malingerer because he didn't fit nicely into a movie disorder or whatever. And I think, I think we all have to be, first of all, humble. You know, I had an interesting session with my image, uh, neuro imaging analysis type people, because we were talking about different diagnoses. And they were shocked to think that we could make mistakes in the diagnosis of these diseases. <laughs> and uh, we do autopsies uh, on the doctors, everybody. And I tell you, it's humbling. And if you get like 80%, 85% correct, you're doing know, well, you miss a lot of the common comorbidities, right? But, uh, so I, I think, I don't think it's straight. I think the, I think there's a certain pragmatic aspect of being called dementia, helps you get access, helps people understand things, helps to bring it home. At the same time, it's uh, terribly, terribly humiliating, can be, if people make it that way. And so, I don't know what the right answer is, but I'm not sure calling it major and, and mild neurocognitive disorder is exactly solving the problem. Comments? Um, yeah, first of all, a great compliment on making clear things that to a lay person is very, very hard to understand. Um, and in connection with this stigma, and in connection with your thought that physical activity and diet uh, and social, cognitive social and physical activity are all so important, I think what it does is when you name something that's scary, such as dementia, but you also give some individual agency to people who say, from early on, from the time your kids are small, exercise, focus on what you're doing, and your lifestyle changes. So I think as, as one needs a little tension when, in life, hearing the term of uh, brain disorders, but giving them also the tool that is at everyone's uh, hand, namely interacting with people, socializing. All the kinds of things that we're learning, and as we're getting all much older, I mean, some of us <laughs> even much older than we thought we might even get, uh, we are uh, benefiting from what we have done in early life. But your point that you can get into this setup at any point, I think, is a tremendous, tremendous lesson that we really should all take out of this room with us and you know, do it. It's never too late. And the thing that you fear can be something that you have some agency Yeah, and over. in fact, even <laughs> people with me, when also there's a new people who are not physically impaired, yeah. I think they have Parkinson's and strokes, yeah, very right. complicated. Um, it gives them something to work on, right. too. And when they, when they are doing it, I mean, you know, we, we kind of joke about this, but we almost want to give them little, little smiley faces or little stars, sticky stars, you know, like, just way to go. Or they lose weight or something like that, and you think, and you're saying to them, this is great. Look what you're doing. Look, look what you've done. And often there's a family member that's got to be brought in. So I think it, it is. It can be a positive message when people know that they're starting to have problems, even as it's an incentive to the family doctors. We say, how about putting dementia, bad term, in with you know preventing stroke, heart attack, and other mm -hmm. bad things because of vascular disease. And so for some family doctors, the risk of dementia becomes very incentivizing to get people to go and exercise, right? 
So it can be used in that way, and as I say, also for insurers and disability, you know, like advocate for people to get help. Um, and it's helpful. But in the day-to-day -day discourse, um, you know, it's, folks don't mix with their friends anymore. They don't know how to talk to each other. They're ashamed. All of these things, and even more so in you know, mental health disorders that affect the other people. But I, I do think, um, I don't know, Peter, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, with regards to? The stigma. Yeah, uh, by the way, with regards to Parkinson's, we have a group at Baycrest now looking at dance. Mm -hmm. um, because I think you've had actually, many of you have exercised the music too, but yeah. the music dimension to that, I think, enhances that really. I liked your response. I think it's a tough issue. Um, I think it actually has to be kind of almost taken out of the dementia context alone into a social context about how we deal with people with disabilities more, more generally. Um, I also think uh, if Canada could bring humility uh, to the dementia field, that would be a major international contribution. Because I, I, but that's I think, very stigmatizing. You know, <laughs> the, the, but what I, say sometimes, what I sometimes say is the experts suffer from hardening of the categories. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, and honestly, you know, the, the fact that, and sometimes I think they're a little out of touch with reality, which of course includes the psychosis. So I think we all, we all have the human condition, we're all not terribly good in our activities of daily living. So I don't want to demean the fact that some people are much more challenged and much more dependent than others. But in Canada and the United States, we're forever trying to celebrate independence. And if we could learn that we're all really interdependent, that would be a profound lesson that comes out of dementia for the rest of the, for those of us that are not yet as cognitively impaired as some of those people we label. My own view. It's complex. Any other questions? Yeah. I had two from the uh, people who are participating oh, great. online. Oh, Yeah, thank you. Um, and the first one was about, um, was there, is there any talk that you know of, uh, of the various societies, like Alzheimer's groups, heart and stroke, Parkinson's, uh, forming any kind of coalition or joining forces to get the message out about physical activity and lifestyle? Uh, to work collaboratively? Yeah, very much so. In Ontario, there's something called the Inter Integrated Vascular Health Strategy, where precisely that has happened. I don't know about Parkinson's. It's very interesting that Parkinson's patients often have what kind of disease because they're older people. They are kind of co-occurring. Um, and so I don't know about Parkinson's disease. There's also a neurological charities uh, collaboration going on in Canada where we're just trying to even get epidemiological information about the different disorders. Um, the Ontario Brain Institute in Ontario is also trying to get people kind of collaborating together. And so one project that was put forward in the field of neurodegeneration included um, not as people with Alzheimer's, so to speak, but uh, Parkinson's and vascular and uh, frontal disorders, um, all in sort of a gamish. And um, I, you know, I, think, I think it's starting to get some traction, this uh, notion. But it's still very problematic. It's like, you know, each foundation, each hospital is competing with each other, the foundation and with the university and with, you know, the, uh, the various agencies. And everybody's trying to survive in very difficult physical times. But there have been some, um, actually, uh, material collaboration. So the Alzheimer's Society and uh, CIHR and Heart and Stroke actually put together some grants a few years ago, bridging these areas and also some uh, fellowship and training dollars. Right now, Heart and Stroke and uh, um, CIHR have uh, some uh, collaborations going on as well, and you can sort of cross boundaries a bit. But I think it's still very uh, problematic. I mean, on the other hand, the government hates silos. Um, and the, the problem there is you have to be, so they like everything to be you know, cardiovascular. I keep pointing out that cardiovascular is fine, but and cardiovascular is part of cerebrovascular sense. But then, what happens when you enter the brain it is quite different than what happens when you enter the heart. It's actually more like acquired brain injury, traumatic brain injury, etc., like that, right? So um, you have to be. I mean, the silos have a reason for being. It's just that people have to be more interactive. I think you know, doing common assessments and having more crosstalk, having sort of um, integrated approaches uh, is the way to go, um, while recognizing that there are some differences as well. And so there's a little bit of activity, probably even more. I think there, there is in Ontario this major integrated uh, uh, 
uh, vascular health plan, which might go away down to clinics, where you have multidisciplinary clinics with cardiologists, family doctors, neurologists, etc., all serving, and diabetologists serving people. Um, they might even do cognitive assessment. That would be amazing. And um, so on and so forth. But certainly a lot more could be done. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the other question they, that two people had, the same question, um, about the vascular related pharmaceuticals, uh, they wondered if um, if these could benefit the brain, if, if brain training interventions could delay the onset of cognitive impairment. They're thinking of like luminosity and things of that nature. Yeah, so I don't, I mean, this is becoming a huge market, right? And uh, lots of stuff out there. And I think um, there's sort of different organizations trying to do this in a kind of uh, respectable fashion, including Baycrest, where you know, the Brain Fitness Center, people are trying to use principles of cognitive neuroscience to design programs that make sense in how the brain functions. Um, and I think that we will, you know, we are seeing that you can actually change brain network uh, activity by interventions that are, um, you know, speaking to various cognitive deficits. There's something called goal management training, for example, for people who have executive deficits, where they they have something called goal neglect. They they, they don't get to their goal because they get distracted by other things and then they're frustrated and they're not sort of effective in you know, maybe their work or their daily life or whatever, and there are training techniques that can actually help people to overcome those problems. We've even been involved in a very interesting little pilot study where we use web-based small groups of four people um, who have vascular diseases of different sorts, and I think at the end there's even some of vascular ADD, and uh, in groups of four, it turns out that they were interacting very well, almost like in class, and it made a big difference because they didn't have to travel in Toronto. It's getting in and parking is tough. So it actually was conducted successfully um, uh, on an internet-based uh, interaction, regular exercises, regular meetings, etc. So there is a lot you can do with, with I think, uh, cognitive uh, retraining, um, and I think that is a very important um, approach to all of this as well. Um, I think that, again, these all need to be integrated in the individual person, too. What was the other point that they made? There's something else about um, that. Oh. So I think some of the games that are out there, yes, but I don't know how you deal with this, Peter. I mean, there's hundreds of them, and you know, they're, they're money-making, and sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're not. And, you know, I think you need, you almost need, um, you need coaches, I think. That guide you, just like there's lots of physiotherapy things you can do, but you need people who kind of know what they're doing and can guide you in how you exercise. I think what we really need are are people who can guide and, and, and facilities that can allow you to have adapted physical you know, activity programs and can help you to overcome some of these cognitive difficulties. But you know, in the end, these are diseases. I is really different. Really. There are diseases that do eventually defeat the you know the most active, brightest, most physically active person. Um, you know, it doesn't, we can, we can delay, we can do lots of things, but sometimes, in the end, nature, nature mm -hmm. wins, and we die. Sometimes not as nicely as we'd like to. Now, that's not a good note, Andy. Is there anything? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, we'll do everything well, we can to prevent it. <laughs> well, any, any other? Yeah. I'm really interested in the link between dementia and ADD, but you can tell me later. Actually, that's something we're pursuing. I'm really interested. In I'll, just, I'll just give you a side note. So in okay. the middle-aged people coming into our clinics in their 50s and 60s, I can tell you the three common things that get confused, actually four if you count the women, because perimenopausal stuff is important. One is obstructive sleep apnea and other sleep disorders that are usually missed and are extremely important. The other is depression, because there again, the stigma. Mm -hmm. um, people don't understand it or recognize it, because mm -hmm. it's not always that you feel sad, or you're irritable, and other things, you don't you lose interest, etc. And the other is unrecognized adult ADD. Mm -hmm. It's important enough that we've actually now got um, a student who's working on this as a woman, mm -hmm. because we think maybe GMT and even doing uh, tasks to help people identify that could make a big difference. And, you know, just as we've done, two people, high-functioning people, we tend to get super high IQ people coming with it because they start to run into problems in their 50s. Some of them are women, and you know, they're getting menopausal estrogen withdrawal problems. And um, and yet, it's a huge relief. I mean, we, we have to fill in this little form, and they don't 
how did you know that about me? Because <laughs> you know? it's very confusing, right? And so it's a big relief because they know it's a lifelong thing. And, we just, and then in terms of the kids right. that have it, because um, it's actually probably genetic. And, and so um, that's a start, but it's still, it's still a problem for people. Because it adds, it adds to aging changes. And if you have a little white matter disease, well, it just makes you worse. So it is a problem that we have. It's a comorbid issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra, I think you already have a whole set of cups, but.